Hello and welcome to the Football Unraveled podcast, the podcast which seeks to unravel the murky underbelly behind the beautiful game that we all love. Today we're going to be discussing a topic that seems to be on the minds of football fans everywhere at the moment. We will be looking at financial fair play regulations. What we will be asking is, do financial fair play regulations help or hinder equality within football? Uh, joining me once more with the hosting duties is my father, David Stabler. Say hello, Dad. Hello, Dad. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Uh, it's yeah. not often I see England get to a World Cup final in football. So, um, yeah, yeah, feeling yeah, absolutely good. brilliant. That. Yeah, we are recording on the day of England, having just beaten Australia in the semi final. So, we're all in a really good mood at the moment. Um, uh, I'm on my holiday at the moment, so unfortunately I don't have my microphone or my recording equipment with me, so apologies to our listeners if we, do, we aren't meeting the same uh, standards of audio quality that we are, uh, you may be used to. But um, hopefully our content will make up for that. Uh, for our guest today, um, we will be speaking to an expert within the field of football finance and a senior lecturer in sport finance at Sheffield Hallam University, Dr. Daniel Plumley. Hi Dan, how are you doing? Hi both. Yeah, really good, thank you. Looking forward to this and thanks for having me on. Yeah, you are a um, Sheffield Wednesday fan, right? Unfortunately, yes. Get, get that one out of the way early. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've been a Sheffield Wednesday fan all my life. It's my dad's fault. So uh, yeah, no complaints, no excuses. That's uh, <laughs> that's my team. Are you Always feeling com com confident about the new season in the Championship? Uh, I a little bit more worried about the second game rather than the first game um, in terms of performance. But, you know, new manager, new team, a lot of upheaval. And I said it before the season, you know, you, I would take survival and, and I'll stick by that because we, we need to reconsolidate and, um, and we've had a rough few years. So, yeah, great to be back in the championship. Let's hope we stay there. Uh, but it'll be a long season, I think. Yeah, right. It, it it seems to me that despite the fantastic end to last season, there still seems to be some issues with the club. Getting, I don't know why they got rid of Darren Moore. I don't know how much better Cisco Munoz is, but yeah. Well, fingers crossed for a good season for you. Um, so before we look to Dan for his um, expertise and knowledge within the field, uh, I'm going to first pass this over to my dad. Um, he, he's got the unenviable task of outlining some of the key aspects and points in history with financial fair play regulations, but doing that in front of a football finance professor who knows far more than him on the topic. Uh, so please take us away, Dad. Yeah, you kind of throw me under the bu bus a bit here, <laughs> having this, <laughs> Dr. Dan sitting here. I, I'm pretty much going to just give basically what the pundit or layman fan who's read a little bit about FFP understands it to be, but, you know, without knowing that much about it we all we all bandy ffp around um and i think we understand why it came in in the first place i mean that the, the early noughts the uh decade the first decade of the 20 uh, 2000s we saw um quite a couple of a few pro high profile clubs overspent it, it you would say and um leeds united in the early part of that decade were a famous one um, by the time they went down in 2004, after reaching the Champions League semi-final in 2000, they they pretty much I think I don't I don't actually have the figures for me or on me, but the uh, they had overspent and took decades to recover from that. Um, Portsmouth were another high-profile case towards the end of the decade. Um, they were about 60 million in debt i think by 2010 and had points deductions uh had gone into administration or were about to relegated from the premier league and basically it always seems to be the fans that that lose out when this happens but you could argue the fans benefit when they win the fa cup as portsmouth did in 2008 so um and the, the third one which is probably less well known is Gretna FC in Scotland, which uh, they came from pretty much nowhere. Were only elected into the Scottish League in 2002, but they had crucially one single benefactor and he fell ill. Uh, they got to the Scottish Premier League, reached the Scottish Cup final, um, 
came out of nowhere. Their one and only benefactor fell ill and withdrew the money, funds. They went into administration and the club was wound up by the end of that year. So I think we all understood that by about 2011, when they, when FFP came in across various competitions, that something was needed. And um, the two primary objectives that we understood that were published at the time were to make clubs spend within their means, in other words, to break even incomings versus outgoings, etc. Although I'm sure Dr. Down will tell us that it's not quite as straightforward as that, as we'll, we'll, we'll find out. And to enable the industry and individual leagues to become more competitively balanced. And whether that's happened or not, again, that's what this podcast is meant to be discussing. Yes, yeah. Uh, and Dan, how would you surmise the summary that uh, Dad, would you say that he's uh, effectively summarised kind of the basis? I'll summarise it from a pub, pub layman sort of <laughs> point of view, I think. Yeah, I wonder if you were trying to throw me under the bus now with uh, <laughs> making <laughs> making a, a summary of those uh, that little intro. But no, I think the, the main points are covered in there nicely. And, and I think it's nice to finish on the objectives there stated back in 2010 in, in the first iteration of, of what was UEFA's financial fair play. And we've seen different leagues follow suit in various guises over time. But those objectives are always something that, that I come back to, especially in a lot of the work that we're involved in at the university around the, the the challenge of overspending that they were trying to you know look at financial sustainability in the long term and then this notion of competitive balance and if you look at the kind of headline data where we are now uh, and given the fact that we've got kind of 10 12 13 years to draw upon since the first iteration it, there's very little doubt that the first objective has been achieved you know it took until 2019 but at that point the top the top division clubs in all UEFA member associations turned a collective profit for the very first time. Um, and so there has been some gains in financial sustainability across the board. There are still challenges at individual clubs, of course, but in terms of objective one, we could argue quite confidently that, that they hit the mark. I think the second one's more interesting, certainly, in, again, in some of the research that I've been involved in, in, in a sense that it, we've, coined this term in a couple of those articles of, of this unintended consequence of financial fair play and, and that it has actually, in many ways, it impacted competitive balance for the for the worse rather than the better. And again, I think just to, to kind of conclude on that point, it's it's not as easy as, as David said, as a, a one size fits all or, or putting everything into a, a nice, easy cause and effect model. FFP is a factor, um, but it's not just the one single causal factor there's lots of other things around club ownership um league and competition organizers and their regulations and cost controls and yeah. broadcasting and commercial deals and so it's it's part of a much bigger picture but but certainly it's something that we will continue to focus on as we move into a new era of financial fair play and i'm sure we'll get onto that kind of later on in the podcast so can just to get back to the, one of the papers I read of yours was is the one you published in 2018, which is um, it, it covers the competitive balance um, of the Premier Leagues and other leagues, the major European leagues, for the first six years after FFP came in. Could you just go through briefly how that was? Um, what, what sort of factors you used to, to derive that and, and what the, what the at the time in 2018, what the outcomes were of that? Yeah, sure. So it's, again, that's part of a, a kind of much bigger body of work around this this aspect of competitive balance. So we've tracked um, longi longitudinal time periods for a number of leagues that stretch back to not just even the start of the Premier League, because we kind of think that that's like the start of football, in, <laughs> particularly in English football. Yeah. It's like there was no football yeah. before 1992. So we, we've done some real kind of deep dives historically all the way back to the you know, the 50s and the 60s. And, and what we've got now in terms of volume of data is, is a large trend analysis to look at. And then what we did with that particular article was to carve that up a little bit and look at the big five European leagues in, in revenue terms, which of course are... 
the Premier League, La Liga, Bundesliga, Serie A and Ligue 1. So we took those as, as the case study. And because we had enough data in the system there to be able to track before and after, we wanted to run some statistical analysis to see if the competitive balance that we'd measured previously on a longer scale uh, had changed given two very distinct time periods. And that was the the periods before financial fair play and, and after financial fair play. And at that point in time, what we found was there has been a declining competitive balance over time for all of those leagues. Um, and in many cases, that's a significant decline for some of those leagues. And we found that in terms of the post FFP era, that there was a significant difference between pre and post for a couple of those leagues. Interestingly, the Premier League wasn't one of those. It was more pointing towards uh, Italy and Germany. And then mm. what that kind of the thought process behind that then led us down some different avenues in that paper around measures of dominance within individual leagues. So we kind of honed in a little bit then on uh, number of unique title winners, number of unique top four finishes, which we know tends to mean Champions League qualification and therefore extra revenue that comes with it. And, yeah. and some of these things then come as no surprise. But what we were doing is kind of trying to put statistical evidence behind it to say, look, this is not happening by chance. This is happening because of the designs and some of the constraints that these clubs are working within. And of course, We'll bring that right up to date and, and we have updated that paper for a larger number of leagues in in 2023 actually but the picture is very much the same and you know we've just seen Bayern Munich uh, I think we're on nine straight titles for Bayern Munich oh, I think it's 12 is it 10 10 definitely in double figures yeah. but that, that which is Pro probably which is an, an 11th to come this year as well and and not just that, but the, the nature of the clubs that make up that kind of top four, top six in, in the individual leagues. And it paints quite a quite a sombre picture, really, for, for fans of other clubs, because what that data showed us over time is that there is also not just a declining competitive balance, e.g. The, the, le the teams are less closer together than they ever have been, um, not just the fact that there are less unique title winners, the case of Germany and, and we can also mm. look at other leagues that have dominated yeah. by one or a select number of clubs but and also the the number of unique top four finishes and, and actually you know the clubs that are consistently getting into the Champions League or at least making the qualifying stages uh, and that's that kind of go back to that unintended consequence I don't think for one minute that FFP was designed to do that um, but it was always going to be and this was again our arguments not changed since start of those regulations we pitched it as a worry at the time that this could be a problem and that you were almost pulling the ladder up from other teams below and closing the door and yeah. for the most part that has transpired um the, the the weird paradox in all of that of course is that we're talking around the, these figures that show a pretty concerning trend in terms of competitive balance but we're also talking about that at a time when the broadcast deals have gone up and up um, particularly domestically for a lot of leagues and internationally. There's more commercial partners and sponsors wanting to get involved in football than ever before. There's new money coming in from sovereign wealth funds and private equity funds. And, and that flies against, you know, the economic theory of, of sports in general, in a sense that it, the American sport model says that you need to keep your teams close together for, for it to be an attractive product. And we haven't got that yeah. as much in football, but we've still got an attractive product. It's odd that America has that, you know, in their <laughs> sports model, but in, and not necessarily in society in general. But that's a different. It is odd. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> it is anecdotally, though. I mean, my it, it when you competitive balance. When I first got into football, my first the first year I can remember is nineteen sixty nine. That is right in the middle of a fifteen year period when ten different clubs won the uh, first division title. 10 different ones, including Burnley, Ipswich, Derby County. Um, it, it, and so I kind of thought that's what was always going to happen. So you'd have this regular churn of different clubs near the top. Um, they change over time. And Man United won it twice and Liverpool twice and Everton twice. But in general, there was, if you had a fair wind and decent 
players um, and a bit of luck, you could you could challenge near the top for a few years, like Ipswich did, mm. and whatever. And mm. I, I guess we were never going to get back to 1960, 75 anyway, but because uh, that was that's old history. But it does seem, even since the Premier League started, there's a, a massive. Sorry, so I've, I've gone off on a tangent here, but, but in 2018, your paper indicated there were four there were four different title winners over the previous six years. But actually, since then, as you've indicated, really, your more recent paper will show that Mad City won five of the last six. So it's a bit more sombre. Mm. Yeah, and and it's those kind of metrics that you know people will always point to, and and it, again, you know compare that with the american model and and the stats generally tend to back up the model so you we're not saying the american model is absolutely equal and that you're going to get a, a unique winner of the super bowl every year but you get more unique winners of the super bowl than we have done premier league title winners as an example if you track the time period mm. so I, I think something that i've always kind of called for and, and some of the recommendations because of course the obvious question to to some of this is so what you know i've we're kind of saying that ourselves there's been a declining competitive balance which we think is a bad thing but it's come at a time where the money coming into the game from various sources just keeps going up and up and up so there, there is a, a practical question of so what but I, I guess the answer to that is that what we can do is through some of this is to start to not kind of realign to ultimate equality as you were saying David or or maybe that doesn't bring in lots of other clubs but we need to look at closing the financial gap between leagues. We need to look at a better redistribution of broadcasting money, particularly within English football. And we need to promote financial sustainability at club level. We need to support as many clubs as possible. And and in doing that, we will mm. um, go some way to, to closing that gap. And, and I'm not suggesting that all things should be equal. I don't think that's the model that we subscribe to in certainly in English football and, and I'm kind of you know very much all for that still but we have to look at ways to to close the gap so that we we don't get some of these instances whereby okay the Premier League is more competitive than the Bundesliga as an example but mm. we pretty much know talking now that that come May we're going to be talking about probably Manchester City winning another title or It'll be, if it's not them, it'll be one of the other big clubs. It, it won't be somebody from left field. Um, it's not going to be Aston Villa, is it? Um, yeah. that, that happens once every 50 years. And, and my worry is that that won't happen again for another 50 years. Mm. Yeah. You um, you mentioned the, the Bundesliga. Um, and I, I'm, I'm actually in Germany at the moment. And I've been speaking with lots of German football fans at um, a wedding that I attended the other day. Um, and if I, if I look at German football, there's many things that I admire about that football. The, the level of access that fans have with their clubs and the relationships they have with their clubs. The ticket prices are just fantastic. Um, and the football itself seems to be really entertaining. Um, and they have the, the 50 plus one model in which the ownership structures of clubs, um, the dominance shareholder has to be uh, fa uh, fan groups themselves. Um, now, for me, that, that's fantastic, and that, that really um, brings the fans closer to the clubs themselves. But um, it's at the same time we're watching Bayern Munich win, and, and they just won 11, by the way, I just checked. But um, we, we're watching Bayern Munich win 11 titles in a row, probably 12 next year. Um, it, it, could the 50 plus one model actually be um, contributing towards an inequality uh, under FFP regulations? Is that something, or, or yeah, maybe you can explain I, that. I, th I think. Not just that, but but again, some of the more wider factors, and you've actually had the you know the chief exec of the Bundesliga recently, and other senior figures in the game in Germany coming out and saying exactly that. You know, they've they've kind of sort of testing the water now with actually we might need to have a look at this model because it's it's stifling investment in our league, and and that you know that has links to some of the private equity firms that are looking at getting involved, and I, I think there is a genuine argument that that the Bundesliga is is inhibiting some of its own growth by sticking to that model the counter to that as you say is that it is the model that it, you you imagine the, the kind of backlash from the fans in germany if you were to to try and rip that model up but but mm. the, there's some interesting subplots within that as well because people often and 
we look in the English game to, well, we should copy the German model, but it's actually not fan ownership in the sense that most people define fan ownership. It, it gives them a membership vote that almost acts as a kind of golden veto. Um, but it's not necessarily that they're owning the club. So there are nuances in that. And, and you only have to look at Bayern Munich as an example. You know, that they're under a model whereby this 50 plus one rule is is heralded as as the best model out there. But they are backed by corporate their ownership model is made up of corporate lenders, you know, the stakes mm. that Adidas and Allianz have got. So there are loopholes in that system still that some of the clubs have been able to exploit over time. And that model, I think you're absolutely right, Daniel. I think that model in many ways is is also contributing to the sustained success of Bayern Munich. And of course, what then comes with that is is the other side of it in terms of consistent qualification for the Champions League and, and getting into the knockout phases of the Champions League, which can bring with it anything between, you know, 50 and 100 million euros a season. And and that's 50 million to 100 million euros a season that other clubs in that league haven't got, um, mm. which is which is why uh, Bayern Munich can go out and buy Harry Kane and, and no other German mm. Bundesliga club would yeah. probably even look at that transfer as a possibility. Yeah. There's a kind of... Uh, there's a kind of feeling. Sorry, Dan. Just, just very quickly. There's a kind of feeling about it. Uh, the the later end, the later period of a monopoly game or or risk game, when suddenly one team or one one person has built up so much that nobody else can catch up, and you can't land on a square without landing on somebody their, their hotels and etc. There's a danger that we could get to that point with football, and then it just becomes a self-sustaining perpetual end of game monopoly yeah. game really yeah yeah uh, i think um at the moment i think one of the issues that many football fans seem to have with ffp is the fact that we um a lot of clubs which seem to be penalized within their own break-even constraints they want to be competitive but they can't but at the same time they're looking at Chelsea, who, has, who I think they've, it, since Todd Bowley came in, they've spent more than the entirety of La Liga have on transfers. And yet, supposedly, they still aren't going to be in breach of um, uh, the uh, FFP regulations. And uh, the way that they're doing it, it seems to be that they're obviously amortizing their transfers and contracts over a long period of time. Um, and that th the amortization technique seems to be one of a few techniques such as also bringing in kind of suspicious sponsorship deals, which maybe Manchester City have done or Manchester United have done. But these seem to be techniques which only are available to the big clubs to circumvent FFP. But can, can I ask you, so why are, are not, why are clubs, other clubs not amortizing these contracts in the same way that Chelsea are doing it? And why, why are these methods only available to the big clubs already? Yeah, I think there's again there's a few kind of nuances in that that we we need to be mindful of. So you know the, the principle of amortization and and the way that works within contracts and transfer fees is is nothing new. What we that's how the clubs have always recorded their transfers. And again, I think that often gets missed in the rhetoric. You know, we're talking about people will look at the spend and go, well, you know, how can you spend? 250 million in the space of a few weeks but that's not recorded as 250 million for the purposes of FFP it's you need to record the charge per year which is linked to the transfer fee divided by the contract and obviously extending the contract over a longer time period reduces that amortization cost per year which then helps you with the bottom line profit or loss figure which is what UEFA and, and the Premier League will track against. So the concept is nothing new. That's always been there. The The way in which Chelsea have gone about extending the contracts to seven, eight, nine years versus these kind of traditional three-year, five-year deals max that we tend to see in football, um, there's still a risk in that strategy. Of course there is. But again, it mirrors... Uh, it, there is certainly a cost control element to that, don't get me wrong. But if you look at the the way in which it's come about, we've seen aggressive spending linked to a new ownership model. Longer contracts are commonplace in the United States model of sports, again. So it's commonplace to give players longer contracts in the States. It's not commonplace in English football. So they've they've shifted the narrative a little bit. 
And we know that UEFA have moved pretty quickly to now close that loophole. But they've been able to do that to answer the other part of your question because they've been because of the aggressive nature of the, the strategy post the takeover, which of course only happened because of exceptional circumstances completely outside of football. Um, yeah. So we might not have seen this in a different world in terms of what's happening now at Chelsea. Mm. It's linked to the investment that's been put forward as part of the takeover deal. There's a calculated risk against the rules and regulations themselves. Chelsea are not in the Champions League or Europe at all this season, so they don't have to worry about UEFA's regs until they get back there, which again is maybe storing up a future problem, mm. but they're OK in that regard as we're talking right now. There's a risk in terms of those players getting injured. There's a risk in terms of future sell-on value. So it's not a it, it's not a strategy that is you know bulletproof, but it's a really aggressive one that we've perhaps not seen before. And that's why we're probably talking about it so much. But crucially, in terms of the money that they earn and the sustained success they've had in the Premier League and the Champions League over a number of years has put them in this group of big six clubs that we, we label. And it puts them, you know, at least 200, 300 million pounds in terms of pure revenue ahead of some of the other clubs in the Premier League that are fighting at the bottom. And then when you look at a kind of ability to spend and ability to spend on wages these these clubs can afford it. They're only thing, the only thing they're juggling against is the internal football regulations. It, it's not a question of affordability because they're they're so far ahead of the other clubs. Mm. Yeah, I think I think you just hit on something there, uh, which probably needs expanding a little bit for, for people who are listening. There are different rules over different competitions, aren't they? So Chelsea aren't in yes. the Champions League, so they don't need to adhere to UEFA rules. Is that right? And the rule, and and so, what they can do in the Premier League is different to what they can do in Europe. Yes, it's one of the. It's also one of the biggest challenges I think with FFP generally, and and again has been part of our work in the past around some of the issues with it in in terms of it's not consistent across competitions. So, the UEFA have their version of FFP. Um, the Premier League has its own version, profit and sustainability. They work off similar parameters. So there is a break-even principle. There's an acceptable loss principle. There's all the things that we've kind of talked about for the last 10 years. But but the numbers are different in terms of what's an acceptable loss for UEFA uh, was set at 30 million euros over three years under the old regs. The Premier League pushed that to 105 million over the same time period. So there are, there are differences in the system which are, are, are interesting to look at. But yeah, as you say, David, you know, the, it, it's tracked over three years, so you have to factor in the mm. years that Chelsea were in the Champions League and not. But as we're talking right now, they've almost got a year to, you know, for this to play out a little bit in terms of they don't mm. have to report to UA for this year, but they will do when they, well, hopefully they'll want to get back into Europe and it'll be fairly quick for them if that's the business model that needs it. Mm. So it will be a problem. Or, or rather, it will be th something they will have to factor in and, and overcome in time. But right now, they only have to deal with the Premier League this year, not UEFA. So, I guess, so I guess. How, how, how much are they, with amortisation, how much are they borrowing then from the future? Um, is, it's, is that a decreasing amount or is it? have they hindered their well, ability to spend next year, for example? Yeah, that, and again, I think we have to, balance this with the you know the the way in which amortization works in in terms of how it's recorded and and how it looks because it it's essentially an an expense to to Chelsea in terms of the the value of that transfer but if you take the Caicedo deal as a rough example and we look at 100 million and divide that by 8 and you end up with a figure there of um about 14 million I think if my math's right in my head um so that's the that's the charge per year for that player and mm. and that will then continue and continue but the other side of that is that of course they've had a few outgoings this summer as well which some of those have gone for fairly substantial transfer fees and have also shifted a huge chunk of money off the wage bill so the the, the two things have to balance each other out as well we can't just look at money spent and even with the amortization and say you know that that's just one side of the argument we have to look at the the money that they've recouped in player sales and the ones that they've got off the wage bill as well. 
and all of those things and the revenue and the other costs will contribute to this bottom line figure that, that UEFA and the Premier League are ultimately monitoring against. And as I say, you're right, there is still a, a risk in that in a sense that it's potentially storing up a couple of problems for the future. Um, and, and I think the club are hopefully, you know, aware of that risk. I, I think these are, yeah. I'm not suggesting that they're not, but, but it is, as we're talking right now, I, I think there's a lot of focus on the transfer fees and, and the contract mm. length, but we have to focus in on all the other things that, that contribute to the bottom line position of FFP. Mm. I, I guess yeah. simultaneously, Chelsea are benefiting from the fact that they aren't in the Champions League right now, so they don't have to adhere to the UEFA regulations. But they have to be in the Champions League soon to bring in the revenue that they will need to meet the um, to meet the Premier League's financial fair play regulations. So um, yeah. it's a risk if they don't make the Champions League maybe this year, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can, and we've seen that with. I, I absolutely agree with you. I think part the bit part of the business model and and the aggressive nature of of what Chelsea were doing anyway was always geared around sustained Champions League qualification because you are budgeting for that extra revenue. And as I say, we know that for the English clubs in particular, because the Premier League coefficient is so high, English clubs take more of the Champions League prize pot because of the way UEFA distribute their money. So. It's really lucrative for an English club. You know, we can have quarter finalists, semi finalists earning up to 100 mm. million euros a season from that competition. And if you're budgeting for that, then obviously you've got to get there. And we, we saw with, you can see this with, you know, Liverpool as another example. It, it's not a disaster if they miss one year. Um, it's probably mm. not a disaster if they miss two years. But if you start stretching that into three, four years of missing the Champions League for those mm. clubs that have, expect to be there and are budgeting to be there, then you're potentially storing up problems. And and of course, going back to the notion of competitive balance and sporting performance, the, the single biggest risk factor in all of this in, in football is there is still a sport in jeopardy that despite the odds being stacked in your favour, um, you don't make it because you've had a bad season. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Hence hence this, the European Super League idea. But Hopefully that won't come come to pass. The um, the changes then that are coming in 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 the future. I think there's there's the uh, they're called FSR. Is it FSR or FSRs um, to changes to the FFP rules? How how are they likely to affect everything? And what what are they? Yeah, and and again, I think this is really interesting because we're we're not talking about this a lot, but the, these regulations again, and so this is UEFA's new version of uh, financial fair play titled financial sustainability regulations. So FSR will be the acronym that I suppose we get used to in the future. Um, yeah. And, and actually part of the acknowledgement from UEFA there was interesting because they, they changed the name because they thought that the actually financial fair play wasn't the right term because it wasn't actually fair and and that was kind of what it was designed to do but it was never about creating a level playing field so there's some interesting subplots in in the naming um, but in terms of the regulations there's a a couple of things that are similar um and a couple of big changes that that we're looking at so there are three pillars to this now one is a, a no overdue payable rule which means you have to settle all your creditors within 90 days um that makes sense from a business point of view. The, the second one is there's an acceptable loss, which is still there. So this is the break even component that's still there. But interestingly, the acceptable losses have now doubled from 30 million over three years to 60 million over three years. Uh, and clubs will be allowed to lose an additional 10 million a year if they are deemed to be in good financial health. Now, I've no idea what good financial health definition is from UEFA so don't ask me on that one because we've not seen it um but you're essentially looking at a situation there whereby <laughs> you've at least doubled the acceptable losses if not you could stretch those to 90 million over three seasons if you deem to be in good financial health uh, and then the third one which is probably the biggest component and the biggest change is we're now working on a squad cost rule which is any wages and salaries any transfer fees any agents fees divided as a percentage of turnover and UEFA want that to be at 70% of turnover by 2025-26 and the transition period is 
this season, as we're talking right now, for 90%, 80% the year after, and then down to 70%. So there's going to be a kind of three-year phased-in implementation. Um, and what's interesting about that is a couple of things. UEFA have, have always peddled this rhetoric of, of having a 70% wages-to-turnover ratio as a benchmark, but it's been a soft um, suggested benchmark, not a hard enforced benchmark. So that's changed. And it now includes transfer fees and agents fees. Mm. But interestingly, again, if you go back to the Chelsea example and some of those bigger clubs, and, and if we look at those new regulations against the old ones, cynically, you could have a question of, well, who benefits most from those? And I think what, mm. what's going to happen there is you're kind of saying that with the increase in acceptable losses, you've left the door open for some other clubs to try and break in and, and compete. And they've got, to, they can spend against those regulations because there's more flex if they want to, if they can afford to. Um, but in, in terms of the wages to turnover metric, the bigger the bigger clubs, and again, look at the big six in England as an example, have been tracking at that level between 50 and 70% for the last five, six, seven years or so. So they're well positioned to to deal with that. And they're actually already well in line with UEFA's regs, whereas other clubs yeah. are not. So I think, unfortunately, and then if we throw in the uh, revamped Champions League model that we're going to get in 2024, um, and that means more revenue, more games for the, the biggest clubs. So I think, unfortunately, irrespective of the change in regulations and the naming of them and what they contain, I think we're likely to see more of the same because, to me, they will benefit the bigger clubs. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned earlier on as well that um, in terms of financial sustainability and ensuring that clubs aren't going um, out into administration as often and they aren't going out of, out of business as often, FFP regulations have been a success in making sure that clubs aren't overspending and um, going out of business because of that. Um, but maybe these... It, it, it seems that these new regulations are acknowledging that by having regulations that pre prevent clubs going out of business like that, they are almost counterintuitive to um, maintaining a competitive balance in a, in a certain way, because there has to be a level of risk for a club to, over, to spend beyond their means to reach the level of spend that a bigger club can produce, right? So it is it is is it potentially that maybe UEFA are acknowledging that these are two counterintuitive issues and they are only now focusing on financial sustainability and maybe leaving the earlier outlined um, competitive balance objective behind? Yeah, and and it's really interesting that that has been left behind in in this new iteration. So you know UEFA themselves stating that this is not about competitive balance; they're dealing with that as a separate issue, whereas it was in the early mm. rhetoric in. 2010, as we discussed earlier. So that, that is interesting, I think. And again, to go back to a couple of the other points there, I think it, we have seen financial um, gains and, and more sustainability through FFP, but but only really on the top division level of European leagues. I think if, you know, if we look at individual countries and drop down into the English Football Championship as we, or League One, League Two, or, you know, the Syria B as an example, that's mm. absolutely not the case. There is still a real problem with football club financial sustainability lower mm. down the system. And and I think, so that's a, a, a side issue to mm. kind of the points we were raising. But in terms of that thing around regulation again and, and competitiveness, it, there's, there's a quote I always come back to that, it, particularly in the sporting context, it, in some ways, it, whenever you regulate, you are making it anti-competitive to somebody. Um, and I think we've seen that play out over the last 10, 12 years with, with FFP and, and it will continue with the new financial sustainability regulation. So I think we have to be aware of that. It's just where your club finds yourself in that kind of pecking order. And that's when mm. you know it's really tricky from a, a fan perspective. Of course, the, the only other way you go now is, is kind of full circle and, and back to where we were pre-2010 and, and you rip it up and say, well, we're having no regulation and you know, the floodgates are open, but I, I don't think anybody, and myself included, I don't think anybody really believes that that's the best solution. Um, we're going to be kind of scratching around for the, the best version of the middle ground um, for the foreseeable. Yeah, I'd, 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 I'd agree with that. I think, I, I think 
the danger of clubs going the way of Bury with no regulations whatsoever are are um, yeah too it's too it's too great it's too great a risk mm. and now we've had the Bury example there is the fear factor of that happening again that means that we won't I don't think we'll ever get to a place now where there's no regulation um, as I mm. say I think we'll be striving for some sort of or we should be striving for the, the kind of best case middle ground scenario and, and i'm not suggesting there as well that there's a silver bullet for that because again it goes back to other conversations around as with berry it it's an ownership conversation as much as it is a financial conversation because you know you've got to look at the type of people owning clubs and and their motives and uh, you know we often talk about what an, a good owner or a bad owner is that's a separate conversation for a different day maybe but it does factor yeah. into the bigger picture mix that we're talking about I mean, it, it does yeah. seem even with even with the FFP regulations, Newcastle United, for example, have been able to ma majestically or wrong, the wrong word to dramatically rise up from the foot of the Premier League to a Champions League spot within eighteen months. Even assuming, I'm assuming they are um, not spending beyond their means and they are adhering to the rules. While I'm saying this, but. Who, who knows but let's assume they are then you could still do that it's obviously still the case that that is you know they and they've started this season with you know, after one game won it very very well 5-1 and with FFP yeah, no. it does seem that you can still work your way up with a bit of fun funding yeah um, I, th I think and I think you can and, and I think but again I think that is a kind of there's almost an exclusivity to that. And, and I think Newcastle United is, is the prime example. You know, the, the, the ownership structure there now is, is beyond any wealth we've ever seen in the Premier League. You know, it, it eclipses the owners at Manchester City. So we know the firepower is there. The, the interesting thing with Newcastle as well, I think just going back to your point, David, about, you know, getting there and investing and being able to spend is, is actually, despite the fact that most Newcastle fans that I know and speak to and have, probably hounded me on comments boards in the past that are not a big fan of Mike Ashley, but he did actually leave the club in a really strong financial position for Newcastle yeah. to then go and be able to spend quick and and grow pretty quickly um, because they were, under him, run as a pretty tight, sustainable ship. And when you look at the FFP regulations, that actually gave them, the way he ran the club, actually gave them flex when the new owners to come in to be able to spend... Um, it was just a case that he didn't want to do that, but if somebody else does, and I think often, yeah. as, as we say, there's often a catalyst for these things, and and often the catalyst is is the change in ownership. And you know, now we're looking at Newcastle United, and and I think they've probably overachieved it on their own expectations so far, but mm -hmm. we probably should now be talking about a big seven in English football, not a big six, or actually the position of one of the big six might be at risk with, with Newcastle because if you can get sustained mm. Champions League qualification, which will increase the revenue position and all the other things that the PIF can bring to the table from a you know a sponsorship yeah. and a commercial view, then we could be looking at Newcastle United firmly being in that big big six for, for yeah. as mm. the next kind of entry into it. Talk talking of um Newcastle United, so uh it's it's it, <laughs> One of the main challenges in the recent, uh, in the last 18 months or so, it seems to me for FFP, is the emergence of the Saudi Pro League. So they're able to come in and they, they, they don't have any kind of regulations and they have an endless amount of money. And um, I have seen under some circles, they have been suggesting that we need to get, a, get rid of FFP to make sure the Premier League um, remains competitive and we're able to still buy the best players in the world and bring them in and pay them the most amount of wages. Um, do you think there is a risk that that could happen? And you know, what, what would be your perspective on on uh, if, why that could happen? Yeah, I, th I think it's it's going to be a really fascinating story. And there's a, a few things in there. I, I don't think there's any kind of direct threat at the moment. You know, we're talking about essentially a, a startup league. It, you know, there is mm. very little history there. There's fine. There's Again, a phenomenal amount of financial power, absolutely. But in terms of a, a league proposition, they're virtually starting from nothing. So that it still takes time. And the next big step for the Saudi Pro League is not just the players that they sign in, um, but to get a big international broadcast deal, 
sustain that over a number of years. So it, it's a it, it's a very much a longer term play, and and you know the league themselves are, are aware of that. You know they're saying they want to be a top ten league in world football, but that's a ten year plan, and and that makes sense from a business model point of view. It's ambitious, but it's not impossible. But it's not going to happen overnight. And and I think the interesting thing there, two points, and and then I'll come to the bit on regulation <laughs> to close out yeah. that answer. Um, the Richard Masters, as, as the kind of chief exec of the Premier League, is it, saying it, that they're not worried about the Saudi Pro League at the moment. And I think we need to look at that phrase at the moment because it's one to keep an eye on. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be you know a problem for the Premier League in the next two or three years. But it could be. Uh, something bigger in the long term if if the PIF sustain the vision there for that football league. Um, and then in terms of regulation, again, absolutely, we're, we're back full circle, aren't we? So we're looking at the Saudi Pro League and mm. there's no regulation and they can spend what they want on transfer fees and salaries. Um, and they'll, I'm sure there'll be talk about the, the relaxation of regulation or changing mm. narrative in European football if the Saudi Pro League continues on this drive mm. uh, and also what we should also be talking about by the way is the mls um which yeah. is, is another big player in the market in the future mm. I, I i guess also if i i guess what saudi arabia wants they want the eyeballs of the world on them and currently where that is is the champions league and i could see them petitioning uefa to let them into the champions league but if they do that then they have to then adhere to the regulations so um, well, again. and I think another point to to bring into the mix there as well is is the the natural equivalent is the FIFA Club World Cup, which we we often yes. think of as a kind of not you know yeah. a poor man's Champions League, but that's mm. going to be revamped. The next iteration of that is in Saudi Arabia, so you've only got to start joining the dots and looking at where this might go. And what we might see is you know over time a, a real FIFA World Club World Cup that will. Take on the Champions yeah. League as a competitor, and and of course, I know you're not a big uh, you're not a big fan of this, David, from your point earlier. But I think we'll see a European Super League back on the table <sighs> in the next three to five oh, years right. as well. Oh, <laughs> no, yeah, or in, in in some form, probably yes, Sorry, in some Dan. form. Yeah, I, I just yeah. think we. I might be wrong, but I just think we talked a lot about earlier on uh, around the the inception of the Premier League, and and most people kind of forget about football before the Premier League when we're now looking back that was a real watershed moment in the game for a number of reasons um, and what we're talking about now is actually a culmination of a lot of things that started with the Premier League breaking away effectively we mm. might be on the precipice of something big here in terms of a real dynamic shift in world football again but we mm. probably need to be looking at that in 10 years time um, and seeing where yeah. we're at but it feels like something's there's a lot going on at the minute that that could really shift mm. the shape of the game in the future. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> for, for me, uh, if we are on the uh, about to shift into a kind of new age of global football, or at least English football, it, it, it seems to me that we need to be then. Well, a few years ago, the um, the UK government published a fan-led review of English football governance, and then they. Um, suggested an independent regulator created by an act of parliament could come in and regulate the game with the objective of maintaining a competitive balance and also the um, financial health of the clubs. Do you think that state regulation and public regulation has more of a chance of actually um, maintaining this competitive balance? And do you actually think that something like this could happen? Great question. Um, so I, I, there's a lot to like about the fan-led review. And, you know, I, mm. I, I've fed evidence into that myself, with the people that I work with at the university. We, we've, we've been a part of those conversations. Um, there's a lot to like. My, my worry with it, and, and I said, you know, I said this to, to the people that are in charge of that unit at the minute, the, the, the challenge is that you are dealing with a situation at the minute whereby the clubs are really powerful not just the league the, the clubs are more powerful than the premier league if you look at some of the you know the owners of newcastle united and the owners of manchester city the potential new owners of manchester united if it goes to qatar that mm. they're more powerful than the premier league themselves and and then how does a government regulatory body sit above the top of that and and really you know independently regulate that that's a, a question of concern 
the other question is who is the regulator because the government uh, you know would like it to be themselves as the ultimate backstop um let the leagues decide on the best way forward but that's clearly not happening at the minute there's been talk of the fa as the independent regulator but they've got less power than the premier league again so there's a real power dynamic that I see as an issue. Uh, I'm all for some of those changes in the fan-led review. Um, there's a lot to like about it, but my single biggest mm. concern is still that how do we get a government regulatory body in place to really force the issue and and does that play out in practice? And and I think that's the biggest <coughs> stumbling block for me still. Yeah. The mo- Sorry. That. No, no, I, I, I'm, I <laughs> think there's a... There's, that's, Carry on, Dan. Oh, I was, I was just going to say, yeah, the motivation obviously has to be there from the government themselves as well. And, you know, we could go down an avenue of having a go at the government, but maybe that's not this podcast's uh, no, it's not. Uh, intentions. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's definitely not my area of expertise either. So yeah. you need a, a different guest for that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, I think that's. Uh, I think this has been a really interesting episode. I, I'm sure we could chew your ear off for a really long time, Dan. But um, we're probably reaching the length that uh, a podcast should be. Um, Dad, I don't know if you have any more questions for Dan before we uh, close up. I don't have anything massive, Dan. Uh, no. Doctor Dan, uh, just just in your opinion, what what would you change about FFP or or F, or, or the FSR as it? What would you if you were in charge of it and writing these, would you throw them out or would you, what would you do? No, I think I'd work off the, I'd work off the current structure and, and look at other things around the edges. So, you know, take a, a wages mm. to turnover ratio as a principle. I, I think that's absolutely fine. It, it promotes cost control within clubs and it, and it keeps mm. wage spending under turnover. But what we have to be aware of is that, that the revenue gap between clubs is then the problem with that because if you're earning 300 million pounds more you're able to spend 300 million pounds more or mm. a percentage of that so yeah. I, I think it comes back to some of the wider points in some of those papers around a redistribution and, and a re-look at the broadcasting model especially in english football um the abolition of parachute payments completely um which i know we've not touched upon today but they yeah. need to go yeah um yeah and 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 a better framework for for financial sustainability that actually rewards good financial performance rather than focusing on um, penalising, you know, clubs that run up big losses. I think we need to look the other way and and do things mm. differently. So I think it's not necessarily a question of changing the regs. I think we we should work off the regs around some of the other factors and mm. and, and not just look at it in isolation. It has to be part of a, a more holistic look at finance in the game. Yeah. I know that you've published uh, some other really excellent articles on um, parachute payments. So, uh, yeah, hopefully maybe one day we can do another episode. Um, I'd love to have you come back on uh, on the pod and we can discuss football finance uh, in more length. Um, it's been absolutely fantastic having you on. Um, let's close up the podcast then. So um, next for our next episode, we will be speaking with a representative from um, Fossil Free Football on um, uh, the fossil fuel industry and their dodgy sponsorships within football. Uh, It should be a really interesting episode. So please, for our listeners, come back and listen to us more. Um, Thank you very much, Dan. You've been an absolutely fantastic guest. Um, And yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Hopefully you'll come come back and talk about some of the other ones, uh, some of the other topics in the future. Yes. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. And we can maybe talk more about it on Wednesday. Anytime. Yeah, yeah, yeah not, not that topic. <laughs> Any other one. <laughs>